First off, this is just to introduce myself, my name is Dr. James Kelly and I'm the Sweeting Associate Professor in the History of Catholicism at Durham University. But the reason I'm doing this is that Durham and the University of Notre Dame have a partnership agreement, we work together. And as I often say to people, I'm effectively the bridge that everybody walks across as part of that partnership. So although I'm based in Durham, I work at Durham and my research is in Durham, I teach undergraduate at the London Gateway, the London programme. And what we have here is the annual Catholic Studies lecture. So there's a lot of partnerships working across between the universities, but in Catholic Studies is one of our main principal ones. So just to give you a few ideas, for example, as I said, there's my course, I teach a course at the Gateway in the history of English Catholicism from the break with Rome to the present day, or at least a Catholic emancipation anyway. We also bring a cohort of students, there's Kennedy scholars up to Durham to see some of the different resources that are there, both in the cathedral, which is 11th century, but also, for example, Ushaw College, the former Catholic seminary for the North. And on an academic level, we also run jointly a biennial early modern British and Irish Catholicism conference. And we've just launched a new book series with Durham University IMM Press, which is on Catholicism between about 1450 and 1800. So there's a lot of stuff going on there, all based on Catholic studies. And that's, if you like, the reason behind this lecture, as I say, is an annual Catholic studies lecture. Now, they said usually we'd be in the gateway itself and we'd be in Fisher Hall. Um, so you have to imagine you're just off Trafalgar Square at the moment. But I suppose with everything like that and drawbacks that come from, there's also an advantage that it means you don't have to put up with me for the rest of the evening that I won't be chairing. So I'm now going to introduce you to Father Jim Lees, who is the Senior Director for Academic In Initiatives and Partnerships at the London Global Gateway, who's going to chair tonight. Thank you, James. Very much appreciate that. A warm welcome to you all from the team at the London Global Gateway who are coordinating this event today. Uh, we're thrilled that the number of people have uh, uh, registered for this event as have. We have over 166 uh, registrants and uh, from 11 countries, uh, so all over the world. Far more you can imagine than if we were holding this event in person in our London Global Gateway. We're just delighted to have you all join us. Uh, we recognize that the commitment of time in a virtual setting may have become quite tedious in these days, given that we're constantly engaged in it with the pandemic, which is why we've formatted this event with as much interaction and engagement as possible. And we will be holding breakout rooms later in this hour um, where we can share our own sort of Christmas traditions and memories in smaller groups. At this time, on behalf of the London Global Gateway, I want to thank our partners on this event, this annual event, the Center for Catholic Studies of Durham University. And thanks to all of our London team who put so much time and talent into this program. I'll give a shout out of thanks to Father Nicholas at the conclusion of this event. Uh, we still have to see how it goes after all. We're delighted that you've joined us. I want to begin by informing you about a few logistics. As we have such a large group this afternoon, we ask you to use the Google form that you'll find in the chat space to submit any questions that you may have for Father Nicholas. And you can kind of compose them while you're listening to him or once we get into our, our breakout rooms, there's any number of opportunities throughout the course of the hour before we go into a question and answer that you'll be able to, to offer some, some questions. Uh, we'll try to get in as many as possible, given our time constraints. While it's great to see your smiling faces, we do ask that you keep your microphones muted for the time being to avoid any unnecessary background noise. And now I want to introduce Father Nicholas Io. He's a colleague and a friend in the Congregation of Holy Cross, a brother priest. Uh, he is an emeritus, an emeritus faculty member of the Program of Liberal Studies in the College of Arts and Letters here at Notre Dame. And he is a sought after lecturer, retreat director, and spiritual director. He even directed our Advent community reflection yesterday on the Feast of St. Nicholas. Father Nicholas is also a prolific author, having penned St. Nicholas in America, Christmas, Holy Day, and Holiday. And so it's only fitting that Father Nick should be here to talk to us about St. Nicholas, not only because he's his patron saint and he's written a book about him, but because it's often been said that Father Nicholas looks a bit like what we imagine jolly old St. Nicholas to have looked. Friends, I turn it over to Father Nicholas Ion. Thank you very much, Father James. 
and um, it's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, Santa Claus or St. Nicholas uh, received a great boost <coughs> in this country during the American Civil War in the middle of the 19th century. Uh, it took a while for St. Nicholas to be uh, accepted in a country that was not um, friendly to devotion to the saints. That was a Catholic thing, and, and America was not a Catholic country. It was more a Protestant country. Uh, but the Civil War, with so many fathers gone to war and not coming home either because they were serving in the war or because they had died, uh, St. Nicholas and Santa Claus became more important to families to try to remind them that that love was still there, still there with God, still there with Christmas. And it occurs to me that with the COVID, we have a similar situation. There are a lot of families where the fathers are not coming home, where the celebration of Christmas is going to be fatherless, but it should not be loveless. And this story may just help some of the children understand that the love of God and the love that comes through the Christmas gifting of parents is still in their life. So let me read the text that I've prepared for you today. It begins like this. Advent leads us to Christmas and we are waiting. And we're waiting for the greatest gift ever given. God will give us his only son Beloved from all eternity, born for us in the stable of Bethlehem. We were loved by God, not because we were worthy of such love, but because God is love. We were not so good, but God was supremely good. His love is unconditional. And that's really the meaning of Christmas. One does not earn God's love. Though God delights in our love and response, one does not deserve God's love. God's love is unconditional, unearned, selfless. Such love is the proverbial, off thought, impossible, free lunch. God's love is something for nothing, gratuitous. You know, that's what has to be defended. Children need to learn there is such a love like that in the world, that not everything is transactional, that some things are gratuitous, and love itself can be that. So we did not deserve to be created. We had no claim, much as a child has no claim to exist before the parental love of father and mother brings the child to life in this world. The commandment to honor thy father and thy mother applies to God and to our parents in this world. That love is the greatest story ever told. It's a Christmas story of God giving himself and his son, Jesus, to us in the stable where Jesus was born of Mary and the angels sang, the shepherds knelt, and the Magi brought Christmas gifts of love, responding to love given, undeserved unconditional. There are times for transactional love. A child's weekly allowance can be dependent on the child doing its household chores. But unconditional love, the love we celebrate at Christmas, has nothing to do with whether we were naughty or nice. Christmas love is love given because the giver is overflowing with desire to give the beloved. This is the Christmas story as God's story. This love is the Christmas crib, suggested by St. Francis, displayed as a visual story of unconditional love in both the church and our homes. Besides this awesome Christmas story of God's love, there is a parallel story of human love, of parental love for children, of human love for those who are family and friends, 
human beings who are brothers and sisters because we have one God, the father of us all. It is a secular Christmas story, much resembling the gift of God. That story of human gift giving may well begin with the legends of St. Nicholas. It was the night before Christmas and all through the house, not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. The stockings were hung by the chimney with care in hopes that St. Nicholas would soon be there. You may remember that from the poem, it was the night before Christmas. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later in this uh, presentation. Now, before we can tell the Christmas story that originates with St. Nicholas, we need to attend to some preliminary understandings. From the name Elizabeth, one can derive at the front end both Eliza and Lisa. And from the middle, one can derive Liz. And from the ending, one can derive Beth, Bess, and Betty. And similarly, from the name Nicholas, one can derive from the front end the nickname Nick. And from the middle, the name Cole. So that song, that Christmas song, Old King Cole was a merry old soul, that's Old King Nick cole And from the ending of Nicholas, one can derive Klaus. In Dutch, St. Klaus was Center Klaus. And when children pronounced the name, it sounded like Santa Claus instead of Center Klaus or St. Klaus, St. Nicholas. St. Nicholas is accounted Bishop of Myra, a seaport on the southeast coast of what today is Turkey. Now this would be the fourth century AD. The Myros River created a delta over the centuries that left Myra, now named Demri, inland. There's a church there dedicated to St. Nicholas. And the presumption is that it was named after the Bishop of Myra. Unfortunately, the first biography of Nicholas was written 500 years after his death, presumably in the fourth century. And in short, we know next to nothing historically about Nicholas. Now we also need to understand legends of the saints. Did the stories of the saints actually happen? Or are these stories fictional? Wrong question. Don't ask that question. Some of them may have happened. Most of them probably did not. All of them were colored over the ages of their telling and retelling. However, all legends of the saints tell you something that is true psychologically, theologically, spiritually. They tell you what people wanted from their bishop, from their saints, from God who was manifest somehow in them. Nicholas stories tell of a rescue of sailors in a storm at sea. Jesus calmed the waves too. Of multiplying grain offloaded from a ship bound for Rome in the midst of famine. Jesus multiplied loaves and fishes too. And they tell of setting prisoners free by fighting for a just outcome. Jesus stood for telling the truth to power. However, the quintessential story of St. Nicholas is the one that leads into the Christmas story. It's the story of the three maidens, which I will relate below. And that's a story that may well have happened. The story of Nicholas that pertains to our Christmas story narrates how the Bishop of St. Nicholas on three successive nights threw a bag of gold into the open window of the home of a poor man whose three daughters had no dowry and consequently no hope of a loving marriage. 
In fact, if their father died, they had no hope of a living. So they were in trouble with the old and poor father and no one else to take care of them. Sometimes Nicholas is depicted with three oranges instead of those three bags of gold. And the three balls seen often above a pawnbroker's shop reflect the same tradition. Now in winter in Northern Europe, the only open window at Christmas time in the cold dark of the year would have been the chimney. And the most convenient bag for gold coins or for candy and nuts or for oranges in winter time would have been an old stocking hung by the chimney with care in hopes that St. Nicholas would soon be there. One of the Nicholas stories tells of saving sailors in a storm at sea. Nicholas flies into the rescue and he became patron saint of sailors. And sailors took the Nicholas stories to the seaports of the world. Sailors from Bari in Italy stole the body of Nicholas from its grave in Myra, then under Muslim conquest and established a shrine in Bari. Sailors also brought Nicholas to New York City. And according to the account in Washington Irving's Knickerbocker History of New York, Henrik Hudson came into the harbor with St. Nicholas on the bowsprit of his boat and immediately built a chapel to St. Nicholas on one of the islands in the New York Harbor. Irving was spoofing at the expense of the Dutch, but the readers of his history took it as the true history. St. Nicholas became the patron saint of New York City. And the New York Historical Society still has its annual meeting on December the 6th, the Feast of St. Nicholas. Clement Clark Moore, then professor of theology at what today is Union Theological Seminary, and the son of the Episcopalian Bishop of New York, wrote for his children at Christmas time a poem was the night before Christmas, which became the most published poem in the world. There are endless editions, annotated, illustrated, and most every child, at least in my knowledge of, of these matters, has heard that poem and knows those lines. St. Nicholas, Sinterklaas, or Santa Claus, comes with a poetical story of reindeer and a chimney descent. That's in Moore's poem. However, he needed an illustrator. And Thomas Nast of Morristown, New Jersey, who gave us Uncle Sam, Columbia, the gem of the ocean, the Republican elephant, along with the Democratic donkey, regularly illustrated covers for Harper's Magazine with portraits of Santa based on the description in Moore's poem. Nast was something like Norman Rockwell, if you have any knowledge of Norman Rockwell's illustrations in the Saturday Evening Post. And that image remains our Santa of today. And while in the poem we have tiny reindeer, presumably for a tiny Santa who would fit into a chimney, Santa put on a great deal of gravitas in the not so Puritan party world of New York City Christmas cheer. Now perhaps we should at this point remind ourselves the Christmas story is a quest for the manifestation of an unconditional and undeserved love the kind of love of a creator God who made us each and all from nothing but love. Similarly, we celebrate parental love that creates children, one and all, from a love that continues to gift them with life 
in the outpouring of Christmas surprises all unexpected. Journalist Francis Church wrote a famous response to a young girl who wrote the New York Sun newspaper, no longer publishes, asking for a true answer to her question, is there a Santa Claus? And let me read his response in part. It became a famous uh, response to that question. He wrote, yes, Virginia, there is a Santa Claus. He exists as certainly as love and generosity and devotion exist. And you know that they abound and give to your life its highest beauty and joy. Only faith, fancy, poetry, and romance can push aside that curtain. And in parentheses, I put between the visible and the invisible and view and picture the supernal beauty and glory beyond. Is it all real? Ah, Virginia, in this world, there's nothing else real and abiding. And finally, let me read Carl Rahner's homily for a Christmas mass. Perhaps the greatest theologian of the 20th century, Rahner speaks of Christmas as the ongoing mystery of God's ever generous and gratuitous love for all of us human beings who are his children, especially at Christmas time and forevermore. So quote, Rahner says, and now God says to us what he has already said to the world as a whole through his grace-filled birth. I am there, I am with you, I am your light, I am your time, I am the gloom of your daily routine. Why will you not bear it? I weep your tears, pour out yours to me, my child. I am your joy, do not be afraid to be happy. For ever since I wept, joy is the standard of living that is really more suitable than the anxiety and grief of those who think they have no hope. I am the blind alley of all your paths. For when you no longer know how to go any farther, then you have reached me, foolish child, though you are not aware of it. I am in your anxiety, for I have shared it by suffering it. And in doing so, I wasn't even heroic according to the wisdom of the world. I am in the prison of your finiteness, for my love has made me your prisoner. And when the totals of your plans and of your life's experiences do not balance, do not balance out evenly, I am the unsolved remainder. And I know that this remainder, which makes you so frantic, is in reality my love, that you do not understand. I am present in your needs. I have suffered them and they are now transformed, but not obliterated from my heart. This reality, incomprehensible wonder of my almighty love, I have sheltered safely and completely in the cold stable of your world. I am there. It's Christmas. Light the candle. They have more right to exist than all the darkness. It is Christmas. Christmas that lasts forever. Thank you for allowing me to talk to you and to share my understanding of Christmas. At this point, we welcome each group or whomever wishes to, to submit a question for Father Nick via the Google form that we discussed earlier. It's provided in the chat space. And I'll field the questions as they arrive and we'll get as many in as possible. We already have a couple that have come forward. And so I'll start with the first one for Father Nick. This is from Juliana Zepp. And she asked the question, 
Many traditionally Catholic countries, such as Iceland and Italy, have other gift-giving figures, such as La Bafana or Grilla, rather than St. Nicholas or Santa Claus. How would you explain the variety of these figures rather than simply just the one saint figure? Well, I, I think the more the, the more the merrier. It's wonderful to have different stories. It's like um, bedtime stories for children or fairy tales. We've, we've got many of them and each one of them has something to, to recommend it. Jesus taught in parables, we're a story people, we need stories. What's important is that each of them reinforces that there is a unconditional, surprisingly, <laughs> something for nothing love in this world that is really God's love and is, is mimicked and, and, and in some way continued <laughs> by human beings. And so whatever the legends are, uh, you know, they, they, they all have something to recommend them. The uh, St. Nicholas uh, got a good start by sailors taking it to seaports. So you'll find it in Holland, you'll find it in Germany. Uh, Henrik Hudson took it, you know, with the, when the Dutch came to New, New Amsterdam, New York City, and the English, you know, it took some persuading to get the English uh, uh, to accept uh, St. Nicholas. It was not you know, as comfortable to them as it was to the Dutch. Um, so uh, I just think it's wonderful to have different stories. That's a nice segue actually into yeah. another question, Nick. These are not realities, <laughs> these are stories. Right, right. And that provides a nice segue into another question that one of our groups has. Um, the breakout room recounted interesting and varied experiences and two of the members of the group talked about the tradition of Father Christmas being overlaid by Santa Claus in the current UK. And I know you've said to me earlier that you don't know a lot about that tradition, but if James Kelly were worth, it, Dr. James Kelly from the Center for Catholic Studies might be able to take up a little bit of that, not being a, an expert on Father Christmas, but one who's experienced it, maybe you could say a word about that. Um, <laughs> I could, I would definitely, I, I definitely underline I'm not an expert in any way. Um, I suppose it's hard because they've got so tied up, but there, there'll be people who know better about it than me. But it's always that the Father Christmas figure seems to it seems to run parallel to what Father Nick's talking about with how with how it comes about, partly, and with the image we have. So you mentioned that it came out of the American Civil War a lot, but obviously there isn't the American Civil War here, but there's still that influence. You know, we're we're certainly we're certainly not like the infamous, and I don't know if it's an urban myth or not, you know, where Coca-Cola tried to trademark the idea of Father Christmas, but obviously it certainly was predating in the UK, it's not linked to that. Um, but I suppose the idea of the gifts and so on, you see it in Victorian imagery and things, I suppose sometimes you'll see dressed in green rather than red, but overall I'd say there's, there's quite a lot of similarities, which I suppose raises questions about origin stories and things like that with these sorts of stories we get but I don't know if that helps at all as I say I'm not an expert in any way on this and I don't know that's just a few thoughts about it no that's great James thank you for that um it's funny that in the same group they talked about this notion of Coca-Cola picking up on Santa Claus now Nick Father Nicholas I know you don't have a history in in marketing, um, or a degree in the history of marketing, but um, there's the question, did Coca-Cola adopt the image that Thomas Nast used in that um, in his work with the uh, Harper's Bazaar or whatever magazine it was? Um, you don't happen to know that. No, I, I don't have an image of, of how Coca-Cola has, has uh, treated sure. Santa Claus, but the, the usual one, the guy in the red suit who's overweight and has a white beard, and goes ho ho ho. <laughs> that's that's uh, comes with a you know a sled with tiny reindeer, which is a, something you have to figure out. The original illustrations were of a tiny Santa Claus, and that that grew. <laughs> right. As we all grow in age, you know. In, yes, in beauty, I like to think. <laughs> Father Nicholas, and uh, Colette Joyce asks a, a probing question, which I think is interesting. How should a feminist read a pro reading approach St. Nicholas? Should a man get the credit for the work of present buying, gift wrapping, and delivery, the majority of which is so often conducted by our mothers, by the, the women in the household? 
Um, or is the myth helpful to both genders for its kind of deeper connotations of giving and, and providing? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> that's a good, someone mentioned La Bifana. I think that's the Italian yeah. version. Uh, and that's feminine. That's, that's a feminine figure that brings the gifts at Christmas time. Uh, I don't know a lot about how that story got started, but uh, I, you know, I would say to the women of the world, get one going. It's hard to start a story, a legend or a fairy tale, but uh, you know, it, I, I wouldn't put it past people's imagination to, uh, you know, to, to start something. Eventually it'll be old and memorable. We had an interesting tradition in our household. I mentioned St. Nicholas, but we didn't really celebrate Santa Claus per se. We, we celebrated St. Nicholas and then we, we celebrated Jesus' birthday. And I think it was my mother and father's way of getting out of getting each of their 10 children multiple gifts. So we, um, we celebrated quite differently than, than many other folks. Um, but I know that Santa Claus, you know, sort of predominates in people's images. And some of the... Um, the writings, the English writings, like um, uh, Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, while Santa Claus doesn't, doesn't you know, sort of uh, show up there as much as he might be thought to be the spirit of Christmas present. Um, it's quite an interesting um, guide to what Christmas has become for us, this moment of, of family and of love and of coming together. Do you, um, have you looked into Dickens' work in this regard at all? Have you come across, um, his work is how it informs Christmas and our, ex our expectations of it. Story of Tiny Tim, you know, who, the Christmas Carol, who, who needed to be cared for, who needed that unconditional love. And Scrooge, who was so selfish. Oh, that's the Christmas story in, in one of its classic renditions. Yeah, that's funny because one of our Tony Coyne came in with the, the story of Scrooge since I asked the question, I hadn't seen it, but he wondered if the spirit of Christmas present wasn't a St. Nick figure. And in many of the portrayals of it, it does appear that he uh, he's represented in that way. In, in the, uh, the movie version of that that I, I've seen, it's a kind of ghost-like figure, you know, that... Yes, yes, that's often the spirit of Christmas future, which is sort of... Yes, this nebulous figure that kind of leads them off. Are you aware of, of a legend? This is from um, one of our participants. And I'm wondering if you're aware of a legend uh, that made it to India when sailors came to India and brought their patron saint. Um, the person who asked the question, he and his family had to flee India as Christians were persecuted post-independence. And uh, he's just wondering if you're aware of Saint Nick or his legend made it to India when sailors came to India. You know, I did, that's a good question. I, I, I'm not sure I know that. Yeah, I would have to I have to say that's something I don't know about. Sure, India. sure. It's conceivable in the ways that you describe how it moved through Europe, but it's uh, it's, it's a fascinating tale. And um, there is this term, Chris Kringle. There was no internet, and there was there was no. Uh, uh, telegram, there was nothing except boats that brought news and, and uh, caravans on land and boats on sea. That's how right. stories got passed on. Trading, you know, caravan trading and, sure. and, and uh, shipping, which was a lot easier uh, to get to major cities than some of those land routes where you were in much more difficult circumstances. There is uh, one of the breakout groups, the question came up about migrant communities in the US in the 19th century. Do you imagine that um, different ethnicities such as the Germans or maybe the Dutch and as they came over celebrating St. Nicholas sort of brought those traditions and they were incorporated perhaps into the popularization of it in America before wider population popularization after the Civil War? Well, so much, yeah, so much of, of the, the St. Nicholas Santa Claus thing centers on New York City, and it's the Dutch and the English that cobbled together um, pretty much what, what, what passes in the United States, at least, as 
the personification of Christmas. But I wouldn't doubt that other cultures contributed, you know, to, to the mix of ideas and, and uh, you know, who got into Clement Clark Moore's head to write that poem it was the night before Christmas. He was an educated person uh, who, who may have been exposed to all kinds of, of uh, legends and, and influences of other people. Nick, at the outset, we talked about the different ways in which Santa Claus figures or, or other figures are personified. And I don't know, um, I know you, you said there's any number of ways to tell a story, but how do you see that personification of Christmas helpful in our own sort of experience of it? And, and how do you think it contributes to our celebration of Christmas? Well, you know, I, I think for myself, the story of the angels and the and the stable in Bethlehem and the Magi gift giving and all that, that's the story that turns me on for Christmas. But for children, I think that story is maybe they're not quite ready for that. They're they're a little more ready for for uh, Saint Nicholas who puts candy in the shoes outside their door or or uh, something in the stockings hung by the chimney with care or under the Christmas tree, uh, and that that story, uh, even even though you, you would tell them the biblical story too, but it, I, I don't think it, you know, children need a gift that they can put in their hands, <laughs> in their mouth. Right. They need something, something very physical to understand right. it. So I think it's a good story for children. And any of the variants of it, it doesn't have to be Santa Claus or St. Nicholas. Any story that, that tells of a gratuitous, unconditional, you don't earn it, you don't lose it by being <clears throat> naughty and a acting badly, you get it because you are loved by your parents and loved by your God. One of the groups, uh, one of the groups, uh, group seven, which was very active, uh, asked the question, where might the term Kris Kringle have come from? Do you have any association of that with the historic Santa Claus, or where might that have evolved? You know, all I know, I think that's the German tradition, but I don't know much about it. It's okay. like, so I think it's, it's British, but I don't know much about that either. Sure. I wish I did, I hope. <laughs> yes, well, this will get us all a little more curious about some of these traditions and some of these figures and give us the opportunity. Nicholas, <laughs> but didn't didn't specialize in all the other traditions. No, no, of course. Well, and that's, I think, I think the whole group, as much of it's uh, drawn from Durham and, and uh, many of the friends from the Center for Catholic Studies, but the glory of it is that we get perspectives beyond our own. And so they get a little taste of, of the American tradition and how, it, how uh, St. Nicholas and Santa Claus kind of grew up in our, uh, our imagination here as a, as a nation. A lot I of, um, you know, if you go through the internet and, and Google Chris Kringle, you'll get a ton of stuff. Right, if right. Someone wants to write a book on Chris Kringle, go for it. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, we'll leave that to one among us to take up. As we conclude, I just want to thank you first, Father Nicholas, for a wonderful and thoughtful lecture. Um, we're uh, grateful that you're a member of our Brotherhood in Holy Cross, but grateful that you're a member of the, of the community of scholars that is Notre Dame and in partnership with Durham. So thank you so much for your presence here and, and for your time and, and, and effort in, in joining us with your lecture. And I appreciate so much to be introduced to Durham University and its people. I, I think I told someone before this meeting began that I went to school at Duke University, which is located in Durham, North Carolina. And I'm sure that Durham, North Carolina is named after Durham in the British Isles. Yes, indeed, I'm sure. Thank you. And I want to thank all of you for joining us today. A special thank you to our colleagues and friends at the Center for Catholic Dur uh, Set Studies at Durham for partnering uh, on this evening's event, especially Paul Murray, Karen Kilby, Tim Guinan. Teresa Phillips, Jane Lidstone, and of course, James Kelly, who, who joined us today. Um, while this program has been virtual, a lot of work still goes on behind the scenes. 
and you don't see many of the people who've made this possible. So I wanna thank those in the London Global Gateway team and Notre Dame International for all the effort that they put forth in making this happen, particularly Joe Byrne, Tom Finch and Catherine Wilson. And thanks too to Charlotte Parkin, a primary liaison between the London Global Gateway and the Center for Catholic Studies to whom much credit must be given for our wonderful and longstanding partnership with the Center for Catholic Studies. So to all of you from Notre Dame, we wish you all abundant blessings in these Advent days of waiting. And when it comes, may you have a merry and blessed Christmas. Thank you to you all.